It is something that I've done in a very large variety of climates. I've gardened in Australia, I've gardened in eastern Washington, which is where my family is from, and in many different climates in between. I am by no means a definitive expert. What I have to present today is kind of a combination of what I know for, as a from a scientific standpoint and what I know from a practical standpoint with a good measure of my own personal biases mixed in, as Chandra mentioned. I'm part of Incredible Edible Penticton, and we're all about finding ways for the community to get involved in small-scale edible gardening. And so you'll notice a little bit of a slant toward that. I made sure that there's plenty of ornamentals in here as well, but just so you have full disclosure as to where I'm coming from. So, Gardening here in Penticton presents a unique set of challenges in part because of our climate, in part because of our weather, but it is something that if we use the right species and the right cultivars that can handle our region, we can have really, really great success, as is evidenced by the fact that this is such a prime growing region. I was in Ontario visiting some family last fall, and they had a stand of local cherries at the grocery store, and we took a look on the bag, and it said, packaged in Oliver, had a good laugh. But it's all about putting the right plant in the right place. And so we'll discuss today how you figure out how to identify those places and then identify the plants for them. It's also about when you do use water, using the water wisely because there are needs that plants have that the water is going to address. But if you don't get the water to where the plants are able to take full advantage of it, it doesn't do you much good or the plants much good. We live in a desert. I'm sure that we all know this. But I found it really interesting to look at a map of the bioregions in North America. And you can see us up here in this little light green right here. This it's the cold desert ecoregion. It goes all the way down into the American Southwest. It's characterized by cold winters where there's snowfall and a large percentage of your precipitation coming during the winter time, as opposed to the hot desert and the warm desert and then down into the Chihuahua and the Sonoran deserts that get a large percentage of their precipitation in summer thunderstorms where it just flashes through and it's much more difficult for the land to incorporate that moisture. So although we are a desert, we get our precipitation spread out throughout the year and that's one of the reasons this is such a fantastic growing area. But we're cold, which means that a lot of things would have trouble surviving our winters. Add on top of the fact that the fact that our climate is changing. We're not sure exactly what's going to be happening with our climate, but if we just take last year as an example, we had record-breaking precipitation in the spring. I'm sure you all remember the awful floods that we had, followed by the longest dry spell in European recorded or European descendant recorded history. No rain in the month of July, no rain in the month of August, and no rain until late in September. It was also the worst fire season on record, in large part because of this. If you have a whole lot of spring water, you get really abundant growth, and then if it's super dry, everything dries out and it's fantastic fuel. Because of the dry spell and the fire season, level three drought was declared. It was something like the third or the fourth year that there were water restrictions placed on our region. But that meant that any plants that weren't really well established and many annuals didn't make it through the summer. And so as we're thinking about putting together gardens, whether it's something on a balcony or whether it's an acre or two, we really need to think about what we can do to prime the plants for success so that they're able to withstand the extremes that we're seeing. And this is looking at a model into the future and some data. So in 2007, this is looking at the average temperature for the whole year as compared to a 20-year time span. So in 2007, we were already half a degree warmer than we had been from the 20-year time span from 85 or 86 to 05. By 2017, we were a full degree warmer than we had been during that 20-year time span. And the projection is that it's just going to keep getting warmer and warmer and warmer by about half a degree per decade. And so we do need plants that can survive those warmer summers and can probably tolerate the winters a little bit better. So there is a bit of a trade-off there. So let's start thinking about the plants. What do plants need? I'm going to take everyone way back to high school biology. 
And here's a model of a tree, and then I'll tell you why it's all wrong in just a minute. But what the trees have as input is water coming in the roots, sunlight coming into the leaves, and keep in mind that in evergreens, the needles are leaves, so anywhere that's green that has chlorophyll is considered a leaf, more or less. They need airflow so that they can get carbon dioxide in, and they need nutrients, which they'll take up through their roots. Water is really key to that. It's not just that they need water to transpirate and to do their photosynthesis, but they also can't get their minerals without water because they take the minerals up in solution into their roots. And so water is really key to two of the four things that plants need to survive. The reason I'm going to tell you this is all wrong is that that kind of classic picture that we have where the roots echo the crown, it's not actually how most plants grow. National Arbor Foundation put out this really great diagram showing that most trees actually have their roots spread well beyond their crown and in about the top half meter of the soil. Even really huge trees have most of their roots in that top half meter of soil. As your plant gets shorter and smaller, the amount of soil that it penetrates with its roots becomes even less. This is what would happen in kind of normal conditions. You can encourage those roots to go down deeper so that they're taking up more dirt and have more access to water. And we'll talk about how to encourage plants to do that, because that's one of the keys to helping them survive a dry climate. So when you plant your plants, you want to do it wisely. You want to engage in smart planting so that you're not putting, I'll refer to sun lovers and heat lovers. Those are plants that really thrive in a hot, dry climate. I'll also refer to shade lovers. Those are plants that are the opposite, that don't tolerate sunlight terribly well. So survey your planting site. Do you have an east-facing balcony? Fairly small, little bit of morning sun, not much else. Probably not a great bet to grow heat-seeking plants, heat-loving plants. Do you have a house with a south-facing wall where you could put your heat lovers there? Do you have trees that block the sunlight? Do you have trees that change the soil, that make it acidic, or that make it dry? What are your, what's your soil like? Are you down here in the flats in Penticton where we have pretty rich growing soil? Are you somewhere where you have a more, you're in more of a run runoff ditch or a creek basin where you have more of a uh, sandy soil? That means that the water's gonna wash through really quickly. So learn about your um, planting site, your exposure, your sunlight, the soils, the other plants that are around and make sure that you put the right plant in the right place. So once you put your right plant in the right place, you want to capitalize on what you have. There's this thing that gardeners throw around called a microclimate, and that means basically a small area, and we're talking meter by meter too, up to a kilometer by a kilometer, that's different from the area around it. So that south-facing wall that I had in the last slide that I mentioned, that would be a warm microclimate. If you have plants that really enjoy cool areas, you can build a trellis to get tall plants growing up over them. It creates a cooler, more humid environment. So you could continue to grow things like lettuce into our hot summers here when you would ordinarily have lettuce bolt and it wouldn't do very well. You also want to research specific plant needs, and Penticton has a wealth of resources. Incredible Edible was already mentioned. There's a Facebook gardeners group that's quite active. There's a really great organization called Okanagan Xeriscape that has a searchable database, so you can indicate what sort of plants you're looking for, and it can help you narrow down your list. Dave's Garden is a large international peer-to-peer -peer community where people share experiences growing different plants. Um, there's great books at the library. There's the Penticton Gardening Club. I could go on and on and on, but there's a wonderful wealth of resources. So look into what your plants need and what people have had as experience growing them around you. And then you want to establish some perennials. We'll talk about annuals too because they definitely have a place in the garden and in my heart, but most perennials are going to be really resilient in a hot, dry climate because once they're established, which means one to two years after planting, when they've had a chance to build a good, strong root system, their water needs are much less than a similar annual or than those plants before they're established. Again, I'll say right plant in the right place. Look for species and cultivars that do well in dry heat and cold wet. This 
rugosa rosebush right here is on my parents' property. Hasn't been touched in 40 years, 50 years. It's kind of in a corner. And every year it puts out this incredible wealth of blossoms because it's a really happy plant in the right place. You also want to look for species and cultivars that will do well in our climate. If you were to plant, say, oh, an olive would actually do reasonably well here, I'm looking for a plant that wouldn't do terribly well. Let's say that you wanted to plant a mango here. You could probably coax it through the first summer, and then winter hits and it's gone. And you lost your time, you lost your effort. It's really disappointing when you put time into gardening and it just doesn't go well. Natives are a good bet because native plants are plants that are adapted to our region. And even though things are changing a bit in the climate of our region, those plants already have a really good firm footing on which to start. They're already well adapted. Um, again, there's that great database at Okanagan Xeriscape. If you're thinking about plants and aren't hunting in a database, you can kind of think of our area as Mediterranean. You hear about a Mediterranean climate, warm, hot summers. Our winters are a little bit colder, but it's a good baseline when you're starting to play with plants and to dream in February when you just want something green. <laughs> Keep in mind that in terms of those Mediterranean plants, a lot of the annual plants will require watering. And that's not a bad thing. It's just something for you to recognize. You don't want to plant them way off in a corner of your property that isn't accessible by the hose, and you'd have to schlep the water out every single time that you needed to water them. But just kind of keep that in your plan, in your thought about how you're interacting with your garden. So you want to get your plants established. You've surveyed your site. You've figured out what microclimates you have. You've found plants that'll do well in those microclimates and that you're excited about growing. You've decided on some of the perennials that are going to be the basis of your garden. Now you want to get them established. And this is some Penticton weather data from the Weather Network. And yeah, that is correctly spelled. And this is looking at our temperature. So this is, the orange is lows average daily low, the green is average daily high, and this is our average precipitation. I was actually really surprised by this. I thought that our summers were a lot drier, but they're not. What it is is that this area in here, July, August, September, it's just so much hotter that the water that does fall, plants have a really hard time taking advantage of. So when you plant your perennials, you want to plant them kind of here, October, November, so they have a full winter's worth of rainfall to get that root network established. Because if you go out and you plant them, you know, a little before last frost in April, maybe, maybe early May, yeah, there's going to be a lot of water for the first couple of months, but they're going to hit the really hot period, July, August, September, without a good established root system. And so planting your perennials in the spring is a good way to either cause yourself a lot of work or to lose your plants, especially if we have a dry summer like we did last year. So fall is the best time to be planting those perennials. And get your annuals started as early in the spring as you can. I mean, you don't want to go and stick your tomato out next week because you'll be out of tomato. But you want to get your tomatoes started as close to that warm, kind of constantly warm weather that we get in kind of mid-May as you can, because then they can take advantage of the greater rainfall early in the summer and the cooler temperatures while they get established. So you have established plants in the right place after kind of looking around. They're going to need water. So how do you water them in a way that both doesn't waste water and benefits the plants the most? The main key is the soil. You want to help your soil hold on to water. We'll talk about sponges in a slide or two. And soil is really like a great big sponge. So you want to get that great big sponge wet, and then you want to get the roots to penetrate as deep down into that as you possibly can. And you want to time your waterings so that it's not all going to evaporate. Morning is the best time because then you're not leaving the foliage wet for the entire night. We don't really have to worry about fungal diseases here, but if you've had powdery mildew on beans or if you've had tomatoes get black spot, it's best to water in the morning because that helps mitigate the fungal diseases. Second best choice is in the cool of the evening when they'll still have the whole night to soak it up before it starts to get hot again. So let's start talking a little bit about sponge. 
There's this really, really great physics principle called capillary action. Has anyone ever taken a clear straw and stuck it in some drink and noticed that the water or the milk or the pop or something climbs up the straw a little bit? It's because of surface tension. So when you put a straw in, the surface tension between the walls of the straw and whatever it is, in this case it was water, helps it climb. And that force is actually strong enough that for very small cavities, like you'll find in soil, like you'll find in a sponge, it can actually climb up against gravity. And so that water that's deeper down in the soil can rise back up to where the plants need it, so long as you have good, loose soil. As people talk about double digging. It will break your back, but it does loosen up the soil and really help with that capillary action. So the dirt is like a sponge. It can store your water for you until the plants need it. And I actually found this really fantastic picture of someone got a chia seed onto a sponge in their kitchen, came back a few days later. And this is just what can happen in your soil soil is that water can come and help your little seed. The other thing that we can do really thinking about capillary action is mulch, 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 mulch. Because that water will rise in the soil and then if it's bare soil at the top, it's just going to evaporate away. The plants will never get it. You wasted the water. It can be living plants. I'm very fond of living plants as my mulch because it helps add to the organic content of the soil, which means next year the soil can hold even more water. It also lets me get kind of a secondary crop because lettuce is a really great living mulch. It can also be dried dead plant matter, leaves, wood chips, straw. Anything that breaks those tiny little capillaries from down in the soil from being exposed to the air. Anything will do. Remember that if it's living, it's going to up your water needs just a little bit, but not nearly as much as growing those two things alone <coughs> would do. So you've laid down mulch. We'll take that as a premise, and I'll keep coming back to the mulch. You can also build yourself something called a wicking bed. This is one of my favorite pieces of my botany side passion meets my physics. I'm a, a former astrophysicist. Um, because this takes advantage of capillary action. It takes advantage of a little bit of engineering. And it gives you a really foolproof little garden bed. So this is built in a box or a pot or an old tub or an old bathtub, whatever you want to put it in. You just need something that is watertight for the bottom third. And you fill that with some sort of substrate. Could be sand, can be broken bricks, it can be gravel. Something that takes up some of the space that the water can move throughout. And then over the top of that, you put a permeable barrier. You want to put a little drain in, just like we need to put holes in the bottom of our pots so that we don't drain our or we don't drown our plants. And you want to give yourself a little filling pipe so you can get water down into the reservoir at the bottom. And then you put an old towel or burlap or landscape fabric or something on top of it. And you just put your garden soil on top of that. Plant into your garden soil. I was bad. I didn't draw mulch, but there should also be mulch here. You plant right into your soil. And it's going to cause your plants to grow really beautiful, deep root systems. Because they're going to be reaching down. The soil is going to be more wet down here. And when you have a little extra water, let's say you cooked pasta and you poured off the water, and in summertime when it's really dry here, you can just let that cool and dump it into the filling pipe here, fill up your reservoir a little bit. And then your plants can get the water whenever they need it. You have a little extra water holding capacity, and you got to do a fun building project along the way. As long as it's about 2 thirds of the depth, it doesn't matter. You could do this for a little pot that's that tall. I've built, the, I've built two of these that were about, oh, half meter by a meter by a half meter. They were heavy. So make sure you put them where you want them. But as long as the upper two thirds is soil, that's a really good ratio to make it so that your plants have access to the water they need. I like to reuse things, and so I'll use an old torn up pillowcase. Yeah. Um, the, the reason that you want the barrier there is if it's not there, then the soil will gradually fall down and fill in all the extra space down in your sand or your gravel. And there won't really be any water holding capacity left there. Um, and your first question was about mulch. 
Yes, mulch can be all sorts of things. At our last home on the north side of our home, we had huge bed of ostrich ferns. And each year they grow up and they leave behind this, it looks like a pineapple, but it's made of fern stems, basically. And if you took that and stomped on it, you got little pieces of fern stems each spring, and we'd have half cubic meter of dead fern stem. That made a great mulch. Um, chopped up straw is another great mulch. Leaves are a wonderful mulch. If you have a lawnmower and a tree that gives you leaves, run over them a few times because chopped up leaves are even better than plain leaves. Um, you can mulch with anything, newspaper. You can mulch with old, torn up jeans. Anything that will let the water through so that the soil can get wet, but that breaks that capillary between the soil and the air. If you have nothing to put down, you can actually do something called dirt mulching, which is that after you water or after it rains, you take a hoe and you lightly, lightly, lightly cultivate the surface of the soil. And then your capillaries in the soil go as far as about, oh, a centimeter below the surface of the soil. And then they've been broken by your cultivation, by your hoeing. And that makes it so that the water can't get all the way up. It's not the best method because eventually new capillaries will form, but it's better than nothing. So you can form mulch out of anything that breaks that capillary from deeper in the soil to the surface air. Another way to improve your soil building capacity, I mentioned organic matter with living mulches, with green mulches, and how you can incorporate that back in to help your soil be a better sponge. Another way to build it is with anything that is originally from natural plant tissue. Compost is great. You don't want to have a bed entirely made out of compost. But if you work compost into it, that will help increase the soil holding capacity of it. This is one of my favorite pictures of a form of gardening called Hugelkultur, which being from the German, it means they just took the two words, which means garden mound building, and shoved them together, sorry, three words, shoved them together into one, Hugelkultur. And the premise of Hugelkultur is that you take wood. I don't know if you can see it very clearly, but there's logs in here and there's sticks in here. And you pile it with some dirt on top and then you lay something over the top of that. It can be mulch, it can be hessian, uh, burlap, um, it can be pretty much anything, and you plant through that. And as the wood down in the center breaks down over the course of several years, it releases nutrients that the plant can use, or all your plants can use. And in the meantime, they act like giant sponges. I don't know if you've ever held wet, rotten wood, if you've gone out to the coast and picked up a piece of a mother log, they're wet. And so you're just recreating that natural process here in a mound. This one was built out on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington in the town where my mom was born, Port Angeles. Um, and they incorporated this window so you can see what's going on. I think it is just a really neat learning demonstration garden. Um, so Hugel culture, one note about Hugel culture, if you chose to do it in the Penticton climate, is we're a lot drier than they are out on the Olympic Peninsula. And if you purely build it on top of the ground like this, it will dry out fairly quickly, both with our wind and our sun. And so you can build depressed Hugel beds as well, where you dig out a trench, lay um, wood in the trench, and then just build it exactly the same as this. And that helps it act even more as a sponge because it doesn't evaporate out the sides. If you have one plant that you love, that you know is super water greedy, you can do this on a tiny scale. Let's say that you love eggplant, which I do, and you want to be able to grow a happy eggplant, but you know that it's not going to do terribly well with the watering that you're willing to give your garden. Go ahead and dig yourself a foot, couple foot deep hole. Roll up a giant roll of newspaper and stick it in the bathtub and let it soak. And then get it outside, dribbling the whole way, plop it in your hole, and then fill over your hole. And you now have a sponge down inside your hole that will encourage the eggplant to grow a great deep root system. So any way that you can get that organic matter that will soak up water down into the soil is great. You can buy soil amendments that are funky little um, uh, poly, sodium polyacrylate crystals, but that's not necessary. Any thing that can act like a sponge will give you these benefits. 
Another really key thing for a dry climate, and this is something I struggle with because I want to grow as many plants as I possibly can, is the plant spacing. In a drier climate, there are fewer water resources. It's just a fact. You look at your little plant packet, and on the back it says, plant 18 inches apart. You should actually probably make it be about one and a half that. You should probably plant them about 27 inches apart because that will encourage a large root system. Because the roots will go out more or less as far as they can find water, and if they run into the roots of another plant nine inches out, then they're going to stop growing there, and so the plant has less of an opportunity to take up the water and therefore the nutrients that it needs. So try to plant at about, for your large plants, at about one and a half times your natural spacing. It means you have more bare dirt, which means you need more mulch. Great stuff. And it can be living mulch. You could, if they are tall plants that will shade the little plants, plant yourself some lettuce and harvest it when it's you know, 20 days old before it gets a chance to get big and bolt. It will go ahead and grow in the meantime, and it will keep the soil cooler, it will keep the soil more humid, and it will help you really maximize the water that you do use. So now we've talked the theory. We've talked right plant, right place, smart planting, smart watering. Let's talk about how you put it into effect. A bunch of these are my drawings. Please forgive my amateur illustrations. But I want to define a few terms before I jump into this. I gave this as a practice talk to my partner who's been living with me in my gardening for nearly 15 years, but still doesn't speak my language. He said, you should define some things. So, when I say tall or big, I'm talking a tree. I'm talking an evergreen. I'm talking a walnut. I'm talking big trees. You can also have small trees, large shrubs, things like a big Saskatoon that's well established, a peach tree, an apple tree. You might have small shrubs. Those are more like berries. Ground covers are the wee little things. Climbers might be on a man-made thing like a trellis, or they might be taking off up your tree. And annuals can be kind of anywhere from a ground cover to the small shrub, so I drew them in between. What are some things that are dry tolerant? You think about plants that you want to plant, and you get stumped because everything is at least for me, we lived in Pennsylvania for a few years and everything grew great in Pennsylvania, but they get three times the rain that we get here. So when you're talking tall, big plants, you're talking something... <laughs> the rabbits would eat our plants, as my peanut gallery informs us. <laughs> We're talking things like evergreens, walnuts, maples, ash. And those things are going to be the basis of the foundation of your landscape. If you're moving into a place that has an established garden, they're the things you're going to have to think about. Where is my soil going to be acidic? Where is there going to be shade? Once you take those major elements, you can start to think about smaller elements. And these are the things that on a shorter time span can be very rewarding shrubs and small trees. They'll take up a good amount of space. They'll shade a good amount of soil. They'll preclude other things from growing under them, so you don't have to worry about that space if you're trying to avoid lawn. Small shrubs are also really wonderful in doing the same thing, taking up some space, adding variety to your garden. I don't know if you saw the pictures with birds that I had earlier in here, but the more heights, the more foliage textures, the more interesting things you have going on in your garden, the more critters are going to come visit you. And so... Uh, I actually prepared a slide about deer, believe it or not. <laughs> yes. Um, and actually, some of these are really, really good at deterring deer because of strong scents or texture or something else. Um, and the deer are going to get something in your garden every year. So if you have lots of different things, and this year they decided to eat all of your lilacs, at least something survived if you have lots of other things going on. Ground covers are really key, no matter where you're planting. Even if it's a planter box, if you have a single blueberry by itself in the middle of a planter box, even if you mulch, 
not much is going to happen there. You're not going to get a community of fungi and bacteria in the soil because there's just not that many things for the fungi and the bacteria to feed on. You can give it compost. That'll really help the situation. But if you grow a few other small plants around your blueberry, it's going to help the situation even more. So think about ground covers wherever you're planting. They can be all sorts of different things. Climbers really help you take advantage of small space. If you're gardening on a balcony, if you're gardening in a patio in a small townhouse, climbers can really help you maximize that, especially if you have any west-facing or south-facing walls, because they will love those areas. And flowers are just fun. They look beautiful. They bring insects to your yard. They really help make it into an enjoyable space for you to be in. And the ones that I included here, many of them are, uh, many, many of all of these are natives. Other ones are just ones that will do well here and bring more elements to your garden. Let's talk annuals. These are all perennials, by the way. And this is in no means exhaustive. This is just my favorites. If you want to look at other ones, um, again, that great searchable database can help you. If we want to talk about annuals, you can still get in a full set of annual, both edibles and ornamentals planting in a dry climate. There are fruits that we can grow here that will do really well in dry climates. Lots of vegetables that love the heat that we have. I'm hoping that it, on these lists as you skim through them as I'm talking, you see some things that are new to you and inspire you to look into the plant and maybe learn a little bit about what you could put in whatever space you work with. Um, but again, these can fill all those niches from covering the ground and helping the other plants maintain cool, moist soil to taking advantage of your vertical space and really emphasizing the green all over. So let's go into a couple examples. A few times I've mentioned, what if you're gardening on a balcony? Here I have an imaginary balcony, east facing, which can be fairly challenging. Please forgive the strange orientations. I did this not quite thinking about how I might sh um, rotate it. But this side, the east facing side, is going to get the most direct sun. So that's going to be your best growing place. This is back to kind of doing a site survey. The shady side, really great place for people on a hot day. And so you kind of put your living elements where they're best for people and the growing elements where they're best for the plants. This north wall or the south facing wall is going to be your warmest microclimate. So if you have some house plants that are shade tolerant or if you have some plants in containers that are fairly shade tolerant, you can pop them there. Other house plants that might like it outside, you can pop them in the shady bit, because usually if something will survive inside as a house plant, it doesn't mind shade. Let's say you have a little potted citrus. And when I say little potted citrus, I don't mean little pot. I mean little citrus in a pot. With all of these plants that are in containers, a large container is really key because it comes back to that root system in the dry climate. Unless you want to be watering it twice a day, you really do need to give them plenty of space to grow a large root system. Um, so that's why there aren't too many things out here in my imaginary balcony. I have a citrus which could share some space with some climbers, which could take advantage of that wall and of that really warm microclimate there. Blueberry, blueberries love acid soil. So again, thinking about the soils and the other things that are in your site. You might put some things that would normally be found in a pine forest understory, something like wintergreen, something like lupin, other plants that are OK with that acid environment. You could put some annual flowers, which will have very shallow root systems, and so they won't mind the acid so much. What if we have a slightly larger space to work with? Few of the keys to planning for a slightly larger space you can find right here, where I have climbers and then mid-height and then short. And you can see right here where you have taller things toward the back and then mid-height things right here. The mid-height things, they act as a living mulch. They shade the soil. They increase the humidity while still allowing the taller things to the north of themselves to get the full benefit of that sun. So staggering heights like this is a great way to take advantage of sun and create microclimates that your plants will love. There's also a little bit of south-facing wall. As I drew it here, this was my imaginary patio, and climbers would help shade it. 
You can grow tall plants that love heat, like sunflowers or Jerusalem artichokes. Or maybe if you really like fig, this would be a great place for a fig because it's protected on two sides by warm walls. Um, shorter, heat-loving plants could go right out in front of it. And if you wanted to plant a, a flower garden or a vegetable garden, this is the prime space. And you might ask, well, why do you put it there? Put it over on the west side, because that means it's getting morning sunshine. And by the time it gets really hot in the afternoon in our summer, it's getting shade. When things say they need full sun, that doesn't mean sunrise to sunset. That means at least six hours a day of sun is kind of the minimum for full sun plants to thrive. And in fact, they can get too much sun. They can get sunburnt, they'll dry out, they'll get crispy, they won't be very happy. So shading them in the afternoon and the evening, like against a west-facing wall, or sorry, east-facing wall, is a really great strategy. You'll also have a section of your garden here that's shaded year-round. And so you'd need to plant things that can tolerate shade there. And there's a lot of things that can tolerate kind of dry shade. Look under a tree uh, next time you go out for a hike to find those. Um, and there are things that can tolerate relatively dry shade, like underneath a big deciduous tree, which we'll talk about in our next imaginary bit. The things that can tolerate really dry shade, like under an ash. Maples are especially, oh, sorry, um, Walnuts are a special story. We're not even going to talk about walnuts because they make a poison in their roots and it's just completely different under a walnut. Um, but in the dry shade under a maple, under an ash, under a uh, elm, the plants that will grow happily there tend to be fairly invasive, so you want to be pretty careful with them, like vinca and, dare I say it, English ivy. Things like that will sh still thrive in that dry shade, but that's usually just a great place to put lots of mulch. Let the leaves fall, let them stay, chip them up. It can just be a beautiful shady place where you don't have to worry about chopping or cutting the grass or anything else. So this is an imaginary bigger yard. If you wanted to you know, have lots of different elements in it, maybe a little bit of vegetable planting area, um, you could, again, put climbers against a warm wall vegetable garden where it's going to be getting a good amount of sun, some climbers to shade your living area, and then around your evergreen, something a little larger, you would put things like blueberries that love acid soil. And when you're grouping plants like this, an evergreen with other acid-loving things or a deciduous tree with other things that can tolerate dry shade, it's actually called a guild. That's kind of the, the landscaping and horticultural design for it. So if you are looking into design elements like this, go ahead and Google fruit tree guild or elm guild or evergreen tree guild, and you'll find all sorts of groupings of plants that tend to do very well together. And one will shade the other, and the other one will fix nitrogen into the soil, which will help the larger plant with the uptake of those nutrients that they need. And so the plants can have wonderful symbiotic relationships. And so, can you have a projective, enjoyable outdoor space in a cold desert? Absolutely, but it comes back to the smart planting and smart watering, really taking advantage of the resources that we have in terms of our wonderful sunlight, a little bit of water, and then any supplemental water that you want to give your garden. Someone brought up deer, so I'm gonna go ahead and flip immediately to that. I kind of saved this because I figured it was inevitable. Deer will come and eat your garden unless you erect a giant physical barrier. You can spend all sorts of money on ultrasonic things and on motion-activated water things. But there's going to be some dumb young deer that doesn't realize that the ultrasonic is going to bug it, and it's going to go have a snack before it says, what is that sound, and stops eating. Um, so unless you build an 8-foot, 10-foot deer fence, you're going to get deer damage at some point. It's just kind of a fact of life living here. A terrified deer running for its life can jump 14 feet in the air. And so even you know, a six foot deer fence is not a guarantee. And so I just kind of take it, I, I garden with the thought that I don't have zero tolerance for anything. 
I allow a little bit of everything. If the deer are too much of a problem, I'll change what I'm planting. If the aphids are too much of a problem, I will find a way to knock them off with water or to put some dish soap on them or something, but I don't have zero tolerance for anything. Some of the things that you can do to help deter the deer are tactile leaves. So leaves that are furry, like a squash plant, they don't like those. Um, cucumbers, they also don't like. Um, mullen, they also don't like. Those furry leaves. Sharp leaves, so things like yucca or any agaves that um, will survive our cold here. The, again, they don't like those very much. Things that have strong scents, so a lot of your herbs are relatively deer proof. I'll never say anything is deer proof, but herbs are relatively deer proof. They're not gonna go and eat your entire thyme patch or eat, gobble up your entire sage bush, your salvia sage. Um, and anything that is poisonous to them. Things that are poisonous to us are not necessarily poisonous to deer. Um, and things that are poisonous to deer are not necessarily bad for us. So that's something that you can look into. The State University of New Jersey, I made a note to myself here saying Rutgers website and then didn't get the website on here. I apologize. Um, State University of New Jersey has a great database that shows you plants, and it's again searchable, like the Xeriscape, Okanagan Xeriscape website, that shows you plants based on kind of deer resistance. They do a red light, yellow light, green light for how much the deer are going to eat them. And that is what I had prepared. I have a few backup slides talking about other topics, but I don't think I'm going to dive into that because I'd like to leave some time for questions. Should I speak with the hat that the lawyers put on my head, or should I speak with the hat that I wear at home? Um, deer droppings are actually really, really great for your compost. Anything that only eats plants, so deer, rabbits, chickens, although chickens don't only eat plants, they eat bugs as well, but chicken droppings are still great. Um, once the droppings are composted, they are a fantastic source of nutrients for plants. You wouldn't want to put deer pellets just on the plant roots because um, one, the nitrogen's really concentrated and could burn the roots, and two, if there were any E. coli in the deer's digestive system, then you might get it on your hands and it would be floating around in the garden. But if you pop it in the compost bin and give it a year to heat and get turned with all the other things in the compost bin, they're really great nutrients. So I actually rake them up when my daughter is asleep and doesn't come play with them with me um, and put them in the compost. <laughs> So we have a garden on Hastings Avenue, and anyone is welcome to come and harvest food to eat for yourself. And um, we have a compost bin that you can put anything that you, well, anything compostable in. Um, and so you're welcome to pop it in there. And otherwise, it probably needs to go in the yard waste bin if you don't have somewhere. I'm not, if anyone here is interested in vermiculture, which is using worms to turn kitchen scraps into really great, um, compost, but it's a, a wonderful fertilizer as well. There's a gentleman with the conservation district, his name's Cam, who can get you set up. He has worms that he's willing to share with anyone, and that's a bit of composting you can do even if your covenants on your property don't let you. I'm not sure if I would give deer poop to my worms, but yeah. Maypop, oh, I'm so glad you asked. Has anyone ever seen um, passion fruit flowers? Um, things in the Passiflora family. Maypop is a cold, hardy, edible passion fruit. So if anyone has traveled to tropical areas and had passion fruit, some people hate them because the seeds are crunchy, and some people like me think that it is one of the best tastes that has ever happened. They'll grow in colder climates than here. Um, and you, if you can get a may pop at the store, you can grow them from seed. They need to be cold stratified. They have beautiful, their, their flowers are like passion fruit flowers, so, or passion vine flowers. So even if you don't get fruits, they're beautiful ornamental that have the side benefit of a really wonderful, tasty, exciting fruit. All right, anything else? Yeah. So mushrooms, they're really interesting and exciting and uh, you can screw them up because you're creating the situation for fungi to grow. Um, 
they need a lot of water is the one challenge around here, is that it's difficult to get mushrooms to grow in a really dry place. If you have a good source of moisture, like, excuse me, a, a downspout um, coming off your roof that you can funnel into an area filled with um, wood, they'll actually grow reasonably well. There's um, a few, mushroom societies, um, one of them out of the state of California that have great resources on home growing mushrooms. If you want to do it in a basement, which stays a little more humid, they'll grow really well there as well. You can get shiitake logs and dunk them in the bathtub and hang them in the bath in the basement and get mushrooms a lot. Doing them outdoors here in the dry climate is pretty challenging. Please. Yeah. So a really interesting way to set it up is if you have a shady area that's right at the base of a downspout, so cool and wet, um, you can get chipped wood. Um, you want to make sure that they're not old chipped pallets that have methyl bromide or anything that will discourage growth on them. But if you can get just straight wood chips, there's a type of mushroom that does really well on torn up wood. It's called a red cap. And they're edible. They look like portobellos. They're, they're big. And it's kind of a dusty brown or dusky brownish red cap. And what you do is you layer wood chips and a little bit of the spawn, which you can order from a lot of places online, and wood chips and spawn and wood chips and spawn. And you do have to build. I mean, I've built two of them at a community garden I was part of many, many years ago. You have to build a good half meter of wood chips and spawn. And then you water it, and you wait a few months or it can be even longer depending on your conditions but they will grow it's just the moisture is the challenge here yeah you don't want weed seeds in it so if you go for hay you probably would, hay would not be great at inhibiting weeds because it's going to bring in a lot of seeds of its own. Um, it's probably, I would say, trial and error because different sources of mulch may be different. Um, wood chips tie up a lot of the nitrogen in the level of soil that they're in until they break down, and so they make it harder for leafy green weeds to grow. Um, Yeah, yeah. If you want to just, if you're mulching largely to get rid of weeds, a little bit thicker and coarser material will break down more slowly and so will inhibit the weeds for longer. When I said run over the um, leaves with your lawnmower, if you just want it for weed suppression, don't run over the leaves with your lawnmower because it'll take longer for those leaves to break down and so you'll get more weed suppression for your leaf volume. Uh, cutworms, in case anyone's not familiar with the term, it's a generic, it's a general term for the larvae of a lot of soil dwelling or insects that have their larvae that dwell in soil. And as soon as you plant your transplants, early in the spring but not too early and you know you did it right, they'll come crawling along beneath the soil surface and go lunch and chew through the um, the stock of whatever you're planting. Growing up, we lost so many blueberries to cutworms. So many blueberries to cutworms. If you are really paying attention to your compost, you can do what's called hot composting. You need a ratio of about 20 parts of carbon matter to one part nitrogen matter. And nitrogen matter is usually called wet or green matter. And carbon matter is dry or brown matter. Um, 
And if you get that ratio right and you keep it really moist, you can heat your compost up to 80 degrees, 90 degrees, sometimes even hotter, and that will kill off weed seeds. But it takes a lot of paying attention to what goes on in your compost. Um, I don't usually achieve those conditions, and so I acknowledge that when I spread my compost somewhere, I'm gonna get so many tomatoes and marigolds. Um, it's just gonna happen. Um, and so that's, that's my approach to it. There are definitely ways to do hot compost. You mentioned wanting an English garden, and the traditional things you'd put in an English garden are gonna have a hard time thriving here be, unless you put a lot of water on them. But you can recreate that same sort of patches of color with a lot of our native flowers, especially early in the year when you could have lupin and yarrow and balsa root sunflower, and later in the year. The midsummer is challenging because a lot of things go into dormancy with the heat then. But you can recreate something that feels like an English garden just with North American dry plants. Even small fruit trees need of order a half cubic meter of soil minimum to grow in, so like a half whiskey barrel is okay for some dwarf trees. If you want to keep them in the pot, you'll probably need to do what's called root pruning, which means that every three years or so, you tip the pot out on its side, wash off some of the soil, and cut off some of the roots. It's almost like making a bonsai. But figs can succeed in a pot if you keep them small with root pruning and keep the top pruned. Um, if you want to put them outside, like I said, our coldest colds here are too cold for them, and so they'll need wrapping with burlap or with an old bed sheet or something to keep the top parts healthy in really cold weather. Gardeners are dreamers. Every February, the dream starts anew. What if this year you get it just right and the garden is everything you always dreamed it would be and then it's not, but something still turned out right. It's really good to see all the fellow gardeners out here. Thank you very much. <laughs>